So from the Soviet Union, you have a lot of different countries that emerge. Along the western fringe of this area, you have um, places, the sort of smaller countries like Estonia, Latvia, um, Belarus, and Ukraine. Um, you have Russia as a sort of continuing um, major state in the area. Um, down by the Caspian Sea, you have places uh, like Georgia and Armenia. And then um, you have the Istan countries, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, um, etc. in the sort of south central part of the former Soviet Union. With a shift to capitalism, um, after such a long time with uh, central planning by the government, you have a lot of uh, different problems in terms of people's everyday lives and how development moves forward from there. So you have a great deal of industrialization within the Soviet Empire, but the industries are really not built to compete on a global scale. Um, they're rather, uh, you know, sort of built to have a, a specific niche within uh, trading within the Soviet Empire. Um, so they can't really compete very well within the global cap capitalist system. Um, there's relatively poor infrastructure in many places. The economy itself is, you know, unorganized because the, the sort of central planning is no longer there and the sort of organization that supposedly takes place by the market um, hasn't yet. And then there's also a huge rise in organized crime. Some of the requirements of this switch were things like um, new civil code that uh, sort of works within uh, the mode of uh, capitalism and the free market. So you need different laws, like laws that are respecting private property, uh, things like that. You need a banking system, um, modernization of a lot of the technologies that exist there, and a reorientation of the entire economy to function within um, the world system overall. So within this transition, um, you know, you're starting from that uneven distribution of natural resources and uneven distribution of how the Soviet Empire um, spent their money and where they um, set up different kinds of industries. So within this, you see really a great deal of difference in terms of how folks have taken up market reforms and how well different places within the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union have done. Um, in a lot of places, privatization had been hampered by local bureaucrats, um, or there's a lack of investment and not a lot of regulation. Um, and changes in agriculture have lost in sort of, uh, or resulted in a lot of loss of production overall. So from this transition, what has emerged is a class of oligarchs which is a small group of wealthy people that have control over a, company, uh, over a country. So you see the higher ups in the Communist Party, the KGB, the Soviet Youth League, um, as I said, all in great positions um, to take advantage of the privatization of state-owned resources. So you see um, a huge amount of folks becoming um, millionaires and billionaires off this process, whereas the everyday uh, workers suddenly you know, don't have uh, the sort of social safety nets that existed for them before, the guaranteed work, the guaranteed housing, things like that. So it was really very detrimental uh, to a lot of people. So. We see that in terms of uh, the Soviet Union today increasing um, inequality um, resulting from inflation. So there, the money that folks have is worth less. Um, there's declining productivity and pretty poor fiscal policies overall. This has been especially um, hard problem for women to face. Within the Soviet Union, there was this uh, promise of uh, equality, um, and there was a lot of attempts for female uh, representation in the political process. You know, women had access to, you know, fairly equal uh, jobs uh, that men would have. Um, but within the new system, 
you have um, you know no longer these sorts of guarantees you have the loss of a lot of social programs that tend to help women things like um, health care uh, family care things like that a lot of folks are unemployed or underemployed in that they are trained far above uh, the job that they're uh, currently working in but despite all this the Russian economy is really doing well. Um, it averages about has averaged about seven percent growth uh, from 1998 to 2008. Uh, the incomes of uh, mid, the middle class have doubled, um, and really some of the key parts of this are uh, commodities such as natural gas, oil, and steel. And natural gas, especially, um, being sent to Europe. This chart shows the. 2005 sort of shares of the world economy by a uh bunch of different world powers. So you see Russia here is having about 1.6 trillion um, overall in the world economy. What they're projecting by 2050 is that, you know, that is going to grow, but Russia is going to remain, again, one of these uh, key parts of the world economy, and especially because of the importance of those commodities. So then within the different regions of the Soviet Union, you see the winners in terms of development as being uh, gateway regions that are sort of transportation and communication hubs, uh, places that have natural resources, places that have um, rich agricultural resources uh, like soil um, and climate and uh, the money to be able to put behind these natural resources to make them into um, saleable commodities. And then also high tech regions where you have this investment in education and facilities that were, you know, so former military um, facilities and research facilities. Um, regions that are seeing much less development are areas of armed conflict, uh, places that are resource poor or in the periphery within the former Soviet Union, and then places uh, sort of similar to the Rust Belt within the United States, where you have uh, former heavy industry that uh, can no longer compete with um, the outsourcing of jobs to places like um, East Asia. Here's an example of a map that shows some of the oil and natural gas regions in Russia. And um, you see here uh, the sort of little purple line is um, one of the key uh, natural gas pipelines that goes into Europe and supplies a lot of the gas there.